with gravy, sliced onions, a triple patty bacon cheeseburger, a cheese omelet with ground beef, tomatoes, onions, bell peppers, and jalapenos, a bowl of fried okra with ketchup, one pound of barbecued meat with a half a loaf of white bread, three fajitas, a meat lover's pizza topped with pepperoni, ham, bacon, and sausage. One pint of bluebell ice cream, a slab of peanut butter fudge with crushed peanuts, and three root beers. If today's lunch were your last meal, what would you order? I want you to think about that for just a moment. If you knew this was the last meal, this was going to be your last lunch, your last supper, what would you order? Well, the food that I listed was the last meal of Lawrence Brewster. September 2011, he was going to be executed for a murder that he did commit and admitted that he committed. And as the history and tradition of the state penitentiary of Texas, they would allow the prisoners that were about to be executed a last meal, and that was what he ordered. And in a last effort to spite the system and everyone around him when they brought the food to him, he said, I'm not hungry, and didn't eat a bite. He was the last Texas prisoner afforded that privilege, for they changed the law. that now, if you're going to be executed in Texas, you eat what all the other prisoners eat. It is interesting to contrast what a convicted murderer would ask for at his last meal in comparison to what Jesus did with his last meal. For Jesus' last supper, he gathered around his disciples and sat around what was probably the Passover meal, which was a very simple meal, some bitter herbs, some unleavened bread, and uh, probably a lamb. And yet in that moment, he took that opportunity of his last supper, his last meal, and said maybe the most profound words ever spoken to man. We are in a series of Dinner with Jesus. And we just started it last week, and it seems like here we are at the end. Well, can I assure you that the Last Supper of Jesus was not the end of Dinner with Jesus. There is another dinner that is going to be prepared for those of us who believe, and we'll talk about that later in the series, and then we'll come back and pick up some of the other meals that Jesus shared with his friends and even sometimes with his enemies, and we're going to look and discover what those are. But this morning, you and I are going to be a part of that same meal that he instituted with his last supper. And so what we're going to do this morning, very simply, is just to allow the Scriptures to speak to us as we are prepared and preparing at the end of the service to take part in what we would call the Lord's Supper, others will call communion, and we'll gather around this table and try to understand it a little better than maybe what we've had in the past. This Last Supper, this last meal that Jesus had prepared, is recorded in all of the Gospels. The emphasis of the Gospels in the, what we call the synoptic Gospels, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic just simply means to see together. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in the way that they explain what happened. There are a few details here and there that are a little bit different based on what the author is trying to communicate to us. But I challenge you this week to go into your own Scripture, into your own private time of being with the Lord and reading the Bible and read those three accounts of that meal time that he shared with his disciples. What I want to do for our time together this morning is to not look at any of the gospel accounts, but look at a letter that Paul wrote to one of the early churches, a church kind of like ours in some ways and totally different in others, when he explains what Jesus said and what he did. In the letter that we call 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, the 23rd verse, says, 
Americans, as Western Christians, as believers in these parts, we are not as familiar as Jesus' disciples would have been related to the Jewish context and the Jewish culture. They were, in fact, Jews, and so they would know it. They couldn't even tell they knew it because they just knew it. That's who they were. And so they understood the context perfectly, but you and I will just read this passage and not understand what was going on. And so it's helpful to have some of the context around this Last Supper. You see, the Jewish people were a very ritualistic people. They were given rituals or things to do by God that would allow them to remember the things that were necessary to remember. And so in the 23rd chapter of the book of Exodus... God gives, through Moses, some things the Jewish people are supposed to do. In fact, they actually had festivals or feasts or or kind of parties or holidays, we might think of them, where they would gather around and they would remember the things that they had been taught. It is around one of those feasts that Jesus has gathered his disciples. In fact, the feast that they have gathered around is commonly called Passover and Passover is a good term for it, but technically this meal time that they're gathered around is at a time in the feast and holidays where all of the Jewish people would come together. It is one of three major festivals that everybody is supposed to make an effort to get to Jerusalem to partake of this. This particular one has two elements. It has the Passover itself and then what is called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. But commonly those two are put together, making an eight-day festival where they would gather and celebrate God's provision for the Jewish people when they were in bondage to Egypt. Now, I don't know if you went to Sunday school or not, but this is a story we teach in Sunday school, and and hopefully if you don't go, that you will go, because the story is that God sends his people to Egypt, and they do a wonderful job through Joseph and all those kind of things and, and all the things that happen, But after being there for 400 years, there is a new Pharaoh who doesn't know God's people, and so he enslaves all of them. And after being enslaved by the Egyptians, doing all the things that they were made to do by the Egyptians, God finally sends Moses to go to the Pharaoh and say, let my people go. To which Pharaoh says, no. And so there are a series of ten plagues that God sends upon the Egyptians. The last and final of those plagues is that an angel of death would come throughout all of Egypt and kill every firstborn son. Every one of them. How many of you are the firstborn in your family? Would you raise your hand? Firstborn in your family? Raise them up. Every firstborn son would be killed in Egypt as a demonstration of God's power over Pharaoh. But God told the Jewish people to protect themselves. What they would do is they would adopt a little lamb that was about a year of age that was spotless and bring that in to their family for a period of days. And then they would kill that lamb, take the blood of that lamb, put it on the side post and the top post of their door so that when the death angel came around that region, the death angel would look at the door, see the blood, and would literally pass over that home so that no one would be harmed. There was a meal that would go along around that, and they would eat bitter herbs, and they would not have any bread with leavening or yeast in it because God promised that after Passover, they would be kicked out of Egypt, and they would leave so quickly that they wouldn't have time for their bread, their dough, to rise. And so that night came. The Jewish people were faithful and put the blood on the sides of their doors. The death angel comes and kills all the firstborn sons, including the firstborn son of the Pharaoh. And there was weeping throughout the land. The Pharaoh calls Moses in and says, Moses, leave. Get out of here. We don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, the Jews were able to ask the Egyptians for anything that they wanted, and the Egyptians were so glad to get rid of them that they gave them gold and silver and all those things, and God's people plundered the Egyptians on their way out. That was such a critical moment in the life of the Jewish people that they were commanded to celebrate that every single year. So every year, 
believing Jews would gather together, the Jewish people. They would get a lamb or sometimes a goat or some other kind of animal, and they would bring that into their home, and they would have the Passover meal, and then they would get rid of all of the bread that had any yeast in it, any leavening. In fact, they'd even play games. They would take bread and even hide it in their homes, and the children would go and look for it, and they would take it out of their homes, and they would burn it because they... In the New Testament, the idea of yeast represented sin or evil. And so they would want to get that out of their home as they prepare to be vindicated and released by God. And so if you believe the Jewish historian Josephus, literally millions of Jewish people would come into Jerusalem and kill hundreds of thousands of lambs. It was so important and such a special meal. According to the Gospels, the disciples asked Jesus, where are we going to eat this meal? And he gives them instructions and said, you're going to go into town and you're going to find a guy carrying a water bucket and you follow him into his house and you ask the master, where is the, this last place going to be? Where is this place that's prepared for the meal? And he will show you. And the scripture says that Jesus takes his disciples and they enjoy this meal together. He knows it's his last meal. Jesus knows that at the end of this meal, he is going to go and be betrayed and to die. And so he takes bread that is unleavened and he breaks it and he says, Disciples, guys, this is my body for you. And he passes it out and they partake of that. Then he grabs a cup and he says of the cup, it was important in the meal, but all we need to know right now is that it was a cup. And it, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And he passes it out. Now, you and I read that, and we don't always understand what he's talking about. But the scripture, and this is a good tip for you, if you don't know what the scripture says, go to the scriptures to find out what the scriptures mean. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, we are given the explanation of what all was happening. The writer of that letter, probably Paul, although we're not sure, writes a letter to the Jewish people to explain what Jesus meant when he partook of the Lord's Supper and what it meant to them. So the writer says in verse 1 of chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, For since... killing animals and offering sacrifices. And if you are familiar with much of the Jewish history, you know that there were all of these sacrifices they would have to make. They would bring a sacrifice for this and a sacrifice for that. And what the writer of this letter is saying, all of that is a shadow of what is to come. The true form of these realities. And that true form, as he explains, is Jesus have you ever been scared of your shadow? I mean, I mean, not that you look at it and you go, ah, oh, that's my shadow. Ooh, I'm not talking about that kind of scare. But I'm talking about how our eyes are able to pick up movement, and out of the corner of your eye you can see that. Have you ever scared yourself with that? We, we have a, a lot of glass around this building and our other buildings, and churches can be scary places at night when you're by yourself. And there have been a time or two in this church and in other churches that I will already a little nervous, will walk around and see something and go, huh? But after you recognize that it's a shadow, you go, huh, it's not real. The writer of Hebrews is trying to tell the Jewish people and tell us that all the things that we do that we think we get credit for are just shadows. That it's not about being in church every Sunday, though that's important and valuable, that doesn't, that's not what makes us right. Doing good doesn't make us right with the Father. Because none of these sacrifices, no matter what sacrifice you make, will ever make us perfect. He goes on in verse 2, Otherwise, 
didn't capture, and so you have to go back. If you pass a grade, it means either you've got all the concepts clearly in your mind or the teacher no longer wanted to deal with you. And so they passed you along, right? But the only reason you repeat something is if you didn't understand it, if it didn't do what it was supposed to do, if it didn't clear up the problem. He says, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be... But in these sacrifices, he says, there is a reminder of sins every year. It's not that you do the ritual and and you kill the animal and you're clean. It's that you have to kill the animal every year because after you got clean, you sinned again. Don't you love going to the dentist and having that clean teeth freshness? Don't you love that? You just rub your tongue on the top of your teeth if you still have them, and you go, mmm, boy, that's clean. Right? And you make a vow at that moment. I will brush and floss my teeth like never before because I want them to stay clean. Right? And you bring your toothbrush with you, and you go, I vow to keep my teeth clean. And then what happens? We are what we are. And even though the Jewish people would go and they would get their sins cleansed, they thought it just kept coming back. And in fact, the rituals were to remind them that they were not perfect. They were not clean. Because in verse 4, he says, For it is... Those bulls and goats would cover the sin for a season, but never really got rid of it. Have you ever had carpet that had a stain, and you would clean the stain, and the stain would come back? Maybe there was something that got into the backing, or maybe something into uh, the stuff they put underneath it that, you, that makes it gushy underneath. Or, or, or maybe you put too much cling, uh, cleanser on top of that, and that soap, even after you've cleansed it, attracts other dirt. It just keeps coming back and back and back. And that's what we are told that all of those rituals do. It just kind of covers over it for a season, but it never gets rid of it. And in fact, it was never designed to get rid of the sin. It was to remind us that we were sinners and to point toward a day that something would change. And you know what changed? Christ came. Consequently, when Christ came into the the exterior, where rituals and doing all of the right things made you at least think that you were fine. But he's come to do, get rid of all of that and to establish a new and a second covenant. And by that will, Jesus came to do the will of God. killing something for our sin. We, we don't have to keep doing the ritual. We don't have to be doing all of that because Jesus Christ was the offering. He was the thing that was foreshadowed. He was the one that would be able not to just cover over our sin, but to remove our sin, and he did it once for all. The Jewish priest spent their life <laughs> offering sacrifice for people's sin. <laughs> 
That's what they did all day, every day. Here they come again. They just killed something for them last time, and now they're back again. What sin did you commit this time? Well, I did so and so. Great, here's another lamb. In fact, they were so busy that they were never able to sit down. Have you had one of those days where you come home and you go, I didn't even get a chance to sit down today. And so you sit down. Well, that's what the writer of Hebrews mentions. He says, every priest... finished. He sat down at the right hand. remember a lot of my sins. And, and I'm always worried, you know, because they, they tell people that, you know, when you die and you stand in front of Jesus, they're going to take a video camera out and they're going to show you all the things you did wrong, right? I mean, that's what they tell you. And you're going, oh, no, hope they, oh, hope, oh, hope they ran out of film on that one. Ooh, we, we don't want that to happen. The author of Hebrews said, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So in in just a few moments, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we, we do that because there has been a sacrifice for our sin. That if we receive that, we have freedom in Christ. And we also do it because as often as we eat this bread... ...for Him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Yes, it sure can look like a a ritual that we go through. This thing that we do with the Lord's Supper and we pass out these little cracker wafer things that are representative of unleavened bread and we partake of a little bit of grape juice and these cute little cups and, and we've done it probably hundreds, hundreds of times probably as believers. But the reason we do that is so that we can proclaim His coming And remember that there is no need for sacrifice for our sins anymore because Christ is that. And he's invited us to his table. And so as a believer this morning, this is a very special moment in time for us. As these symbols, and that's what they are, symbols, remind us of a greater reality of Christ. But maybe there's somebody here today who has never received Christ because they've never repented and believed. We're going to sing just a brief part of a song. And if you feel that you want to talk to somebody about what that means, we're going to stand in just a moment and we're going to sing a song and you come.
If you don't understand this, but you think that you need that, if you have sin and you need someone to pay for your sin, then you come and tell us. And we will introduce you to this Jesus that we have talked about today. Oh, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that is made for us. We thank you that we don't have to kill a cute little lamb anymore to cover over our sin because the greatest of all has come and died for us. As we, in just a few moments, partake of the bread and the cup, Father, may we remember what you've done for us. And for the one who doesn't know you, may they come to know you in these moments as they open up their heart and they trust you. We thank you that we can come and that us in France in 2,000 years later are continuing to proclaim your death and your coming even this morning. Father, help us to respond to you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? If you need to come, you come. Maybe you need to do some business with God before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Maybe you want to come and pray. Whatever it is, would you do it right now? Do it right now.